Hi, welcome back to Your Story Stinks. Although, I guess I could call this one Your Story Sucks, because this is one of the worst books I've ever had the misfortune of having to read. Although, I guess I didn't have to read it. I just kind of chose to, because I heard it was hot garbage. And much like a car wreck, I decided to take a look for myself. Today, we're going to be talking about The Ink Black Heart, also known as... An author vents their spleen onto the reader. Now, I know people just sort of expect me to hate J.K. Rowling because she's a terrible human being. And I don't really hate her. If anything, I kind of pity a human being who spends their life needing to vent their spleen against everyone who is incapable of moving beyond the 90s because that's really her problem like her entire life like story and issue is that mentally she's still trapped in the cultural mores of 1990 and it's not 1990 anymore and she's mad that everybody else around her no longer conforms to the way things were back then And rather than grow and adapt and change and realize that it's not 1990 anymore, she's just bitter and angry. And she's not the only one like this. There are lots of people currently like this, but she's one of them. And it's really only worth bringing up because her newest book uh, is essentially just her venting her spleen onto the audience. Like, a lot of this book is just screeds against things, tastelessly attributed to characters, but it feels like she's yelling at you. Like, this book has the same vibe as being trapped in an elevator with someone who feels obligated or compelled to just tell you things that you don't want to know. Like, this has the same vibe of being stuck in line at the grocery store and there's, like, a white supremacist in front of you yelling about black people. And you're like, I should probably say something or leave, but I need this food and I don't want to go to another store, so I just have to sit here and listen to him yell angrily about this. And I hate it. Like, reading this book makes me feel trapped with somebody who just can't get over themselves. And I still can't entirely believe that for someone who hates trans people and hates the idea of using the pronouns that somebody else wants, she writes under a male pseudonym. Like, her book is under the name Robert Galebraith. All right? Seems hypocritical to me, but what do I know? Now, I bring all this up because it's a hell of a lot more interesting than talking about the book. Uh, And so I will sum this all up in the best way that I can. Because I think, unfortunately, she's really reached the point of what I guess you could call, like, dead comedian syndrome. It's the best way I can think to put what her problem is. Now, when I say dead comedian syndrome, what I mean is that the spirit of the comedian has died and all they're left with is their bitterness. And so they stop telling jokes. They just sort of vent their spleen at the audience and the audience claps along because they're having their like preconceived notions thrown back at them. Uh, And there are a lot of comedians that have this problem. Um, Dave Chappelle's probably the biggest one at the moment, although he's hardly the only one. Um, But if you notice that Dave Chappelle no longer tells jokes, he just gets on stage and just talks about his bigotries and how unhappy he is about everything, and everyone just kind of goes, yeah, that's great. He's not the first one to do that. Carlos Mencia, Dave Cook. There are a number of other ones. Bill Burr's another one. A lot of these guys who just... Like, they start their career and they're telling jokes and they're being funny because 
they can look out in the world and grab things and sort of make it comedic. And then at some point, the spirit within them dies for whatever reason. And they stop telling jokes. They just start ranting, essentially. They just get on stage and they start just, like, vomiting their spleen onto the audience. And that's what J.K. Rowling's doing with her writing. Okay, you you can say whether or not you like Harry Potter. Okay, but Harry Potter at least is an attempt to write a book. That is a story that, for the most part, doesn't seem to have very much to do with the writer. Okay, her new books are just her issues transplanted and pasted onto what is ostensibly a different story, but it's not. It's barely a story, okay? The story takes back seat to her ranting at the audience, okay? And I don't know if the other books are like this, okay? I don't. I haven't read the other five books, and I'm not going to, okay? The Ink Black Heart is book six, <laughs> okay? I'm not reading the other five books, all right? I have to assume that they have to be better because this one is god awful. And all right, let's just let's just get into all the reasons why this book sucks. So, I've already mentioned that this is just the author's bigotries and frustrations pasted over what is ostensibly a story. But the real problem is that it's an and-then story, and it's 900 pages of an and-then story, and it's just tedious in the extreme. I should point out that an author entirely consumed by their, like, bigotries can still produce interesting work. Okay, that doesn't mean necessarily that it's always going to be good but generally they produce interesting work so for example in the extreme would be someone like hp lovecraft whose work is just his fears turned into fiction and that's part of why it works as horror because he is legitimately terrified by everything and so when he writes about dread and horror, he's writing from personal experience. And even though a lot of it's racist, you grasp the horror that the writer feels. Okay? And it becomes interesting and worth, like, dissecting. That's when it works. When it doesn't work, it turns into an Alan Quartermain novel. For those of you who don't know who Alan Quartermain is, um, if you've ever seen League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, he's the guy Sean Connery plays. But Alan Quartermain is a character uh, from old British adventure novels. And ostensibly, the whole thing is he wanders around Africa discovering black people, essentially. And Alan Quartermain becomes a vehicle for the author to express his views that Africans are basically savages. That's that's what the author of Alan Quartermain ostensibly believed and used Alan Quartermain to uh, express. And so, unfortunately, J.K. Rowling has not so much written Lovecraft as she has written Alan Quartermain. This is a book that exists for her to express the worst of her bigotries and nothing else. And much in the same way that Alan Quartermain does not work in the modern day, this book pretty much does not work at all in any sense of the word. Now, I mentioned before it's an and-then novel. And those of you who've listened to my other episodes, you know how much I hate and-then stories. For those of you who don't know... It's a way of telling a story, okay? When you describe events, if you end up saying and then, and then, and then, over and over again, it means that there's no cause and effect. It means that things are just happening, okay? Things 
occur and there's nothing that links them together. What you really want to do is use but then and therefore, and that's not just a way of speaking, it is an accurate way to describe things that occur. So, for example, let's use Lovecraft again. Okay, let's use the rather racist, I guess, story of uh, the guy who is searching for his roots and find out that he's related to an ape. Okay? Basic story. Simplest story you can, horror story you can probably tell. You have a guy and he spends all of his time investigating uh, his ancestors and what they found in Africa. And he's obsessed. And he's obsessed. But then he finds something. And he immediately requests it is brought back to his mansion. And then he finds it, but it turns out that it's an ape, and it looks like him, and he immediately sets himself on fire because now that he's seen himself, he can't possibly live with himself, and therefore it all must be destroyed because it's all evil. You see how I said, but then, how things happen, how things are connected, how it wasn't just events occurring, how one thing leads to another? Okay, that's how you tell a good story. That's how you structure a story so it works. And if you haven't noticed yet, uh, I'm trying to avoid talking about the book because it's not good. But it's such an and-then story. Things just sort of happen, okay? Like, there's a character, and he creates a cartoon, and then it's adapted into a film, and then he, like, visits the agency, and then they look into the identity of this guy who created a game based on his cartoon, and then they started harassing this character, and then they refer to a different agency who apparently has cybercrime experiences, and then you cut to the person who's harassing them, and it turns out there's other people there who are harassing them, and then these two characters are the same, and then they like, talk to this other creator who also created the famous cartoon, and also that they're ex-boyfriends, and then it's, like, the characters are stabbed, <laughs> and then they, like, one of them dies, and the other one's paralyzed. You see how this is just, like, and then, and then none of these things seem to happen, like, are, like, nothing, like, nothing flows, it's just things happening one after the other. It's the same problem that something like Fifty Shades has. And these are nothing like, they're nothing alike in any in any regard. This is not like a sexual thriller or anything. It's just like, they're both written in the same kind of and then, and then. Things just happen one after the other. It's impossible to tell why things are happening. Characters just do things because the plot demands that things happen. Okay. A lot of this book is dedicated to chat logs, too. And, okay, if you think it's hard to, like, keep track of, like, 30 characters, because every character it feels like from every other book, and if you've not read the other books, I imagine it's impossible. Like, it was impossible for me. So I can, like, and I was trying to keep, like, a flow chart of all the characters that keep that show up and then talk about each other because exposition is given in the most stilted, ham-fisted way, okay? Expos people just show up and start talking, and they don't talk normally. They're like, hey, remember character A? And they're doing this. And remember how character A did this with character B? And they were, you know, involved with character C, and, like, it's just, that's all the dialogue. Half the dialogue in this book feels like it's about explaining other characters who don't appear or appear very briefly. And a lot of it takes place in chat logs, where the characters are only referred to by their chat handle. So if you think it's hard to keep track of like 30 characters, it's even harder to keep track of their 30 different like chat handles and their sock puppets, because some of these guys go by multiple chat handles. Like, you really need, like, a flowchart or something to, like, grasp 
<laughs> the, the myriad storytelling. Like, who who are these people? What they are doing? Why are they doing it? Like, it, it's so hard to just keep track of what's going on and who's talking to who and what they're talking about and why. Now, I, I've mentioned the beginning parts. Let's sort of delve into the mid part because it's just kind of <sighs> okay let's let's just i'm trying to avoid talking about it because every time i sit down talking about it, it gives me a headache but let's just let's just do it so because jk rowling is entirely unsubtle and she just wants to vent her spleen the person who is supposedly behind the creation of the game based around the character's successful comic is named Anami because of course they are and they're like we need to go investigate them and there's so much dialogue as we go through all the investigations because we as the audience can't just know that they're investigating no we have to see the investigations and all the dialogue and it's so boring because it all takes place online with chat handles in chat speak and it's formatted in such a way that there's, like, three, like, every page is formatted where it's, like, three columns, and it's just hard to read. It's just... Anyway, in the middle of their investigation, they start a second investigation, uh, talking about a different person, because this person is complaining that the comic which is being made into a movie and was also made to a game is actually racist and ableist and transphobic. Okay. Um, you can't, can't tell. This is JK Rowling complaining that people object to the way and how she writes things. Um, anyway, uh, then Anami, uh, the character confesses to murder because of course they do. Uh, Except nobody believes that they committed the murder. And this is where things kind of fall apart. Because now there's a far-right hate group introduced to the mix. And apparently they made a uh, fake dossier. And they gave it to the police. And the police used it to track down a different suspect. And now the main characters are involved in a game based around their, like, comic. And they're trying to do, like, a deep fake situation where they, like, impersonate other people to try and get close to the other people to find out who really committed, you know, the murders and stuff. And like, apparently like it's again, more chat speak and more stuff you don't want to listen to and don't want to read because it's all a bunch of people pretending to be other people online yelling at each other. And it's not very interesting. Like if you ever wanted the novel equivalent of being stuck in a moderator group on Discord, uh, and then you put that in for like 300 pages. That's this book. Okay? Anyway, then the scene just shifts dramatically. Okay? So far, we've basically been in, in London because J.K. Rowling is incapable of writing about anywhere else in the world because she's fundamentally incurious about the world. This was her problem when she tried to write screenplays about 1920s America. Okay, she couldn't because she knew nothing about 1920s America and just assumed everything was the same in 1920s America and 1920s London. Okay? So then she shifts it to Comic-Con and the main characters are now like in like stalking people and trying to do espionage, because J.K. Rowling is unaware that to do private investigation work in America, you need a license. Because <laughs> if it's not, you're, can, like, you're committing a crime. Like, you need a license to do, you know, private investigation work in America, and I don't think she knows that. Anyway, uh, then Batman shows up, or a man dressed as Batman shows up, and uh, tries to murder one of the suspects, and then the main character saves their life, and, you know, 
then it turns out that the person she saved is like a moderator for the game that she's been infiltrating and also he's a member of a far right hate group you know um <laughs> like okay uh and then a bomb goes off uh at their office for some reason uh and i don't really know why but then it turns out that the person who was pushed on the tracks is not just a moderator and uh, a member of a far-right hate group uh they're also a physics professor at cambridge why they were at comic-con i don't know okay um anyway it doesn't really matter because then he's murdered then, because the author ran out of plot twists, uh, it turns out that the person that they thought was a Nami was not a Nami because somebody else was logging in as them. And if you're like, man, I, I sure hope that all this talk about people spoofing other people's names on chat boards online is super interesting, uh, man, you're going to be disappointed because it's not interesting at all. But it's very interesting that she's basically just taking plot points from QAnon at this point. Uh... I mean, most people who don't know anything about QAnon probably wouldn't know, like, the relation to this. But, yeah, there was a whole dust-up on the conspiracy part of the internet because, like, somebody decided to be, like, figured out a way to spoof the ID of Q and went on a posting spree uh, and got all the, the crazies all, uh, all riled up for a bit. Uh, and she just basically just steals this idea and, and puts it into her work. And again, it's not really interesting because all it does in terms of the plot is prove that everything that's happened to this point has been pointless and could have been utterly removed because they've basically accomplished nothing. That's what this reveals. Anyway, uh, then it's turned out that the person who uh, was related to the person who murdered the creator... Um, wrote a bunch of misogynistic things uh, because they're an anti-feminist uh, because J.K. Rowling is like a transphobe and she's basically a turf and she spends most of her life being like, I'm a feminist and the only real feminist can be, you know, the only way to be feminist is to be anti-trans. Like, that's her whole thing. So she absolutely needed a character uh, who accused her of, of transphobia, or her, I mean her character of transphobia uh, to be a misogynist. Absolutely. <laughs> so that her main character can be a feminist, basically. Anyway, the person doing all of this uh, is revealed, and it's a character that we've not been introduced to yet. Which is how the best mysteries work. <laughs> the best mysteries are when the, the answer is a character you've never heard of before and didn't know existed. Like, you only knew that this person existed in chat logs, and their identity is someone you've never been introduced to before. Like, really. Uh, anyway, then he goes crazy and starts murdering people like he's Jason because he starts hacking people up with a machete. Um, and it gets really violent for a moment, and it's not really clear why there need to be this big action scene, but there is. And that's how that mystery ends, but the story must continue because, you see, our main character... Uh, while this other person is in the hospital, having just fought off a, a machete-wielding maniac, um, thinks it's a great time to confess his love for this woman. So he just shows up and he's like, hey, uh, we put your name on the door. And uh, also I broke up with my girlfriend and actually uh, I'm in love with you. And <laughs> she's like... Um, Sorry, I can't be with you because I'm dating a police officer. Who? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> not important. This character is not important. Um, and our main character is like, man, I miss my chance to date her. And that's how the book ends. Now, I'm sure some people are like, I have no... You just spent 20 minutes articulating a story that makes no sense. And yes... Because if you notice, it's an and-then story. It has no beginning, middle, and end. It just continues. Things just happen. Okay, it's all over the place. And, like, when you strip out... Like, when you strip out all of... Like... Like, when you strip out all of... Like, J.K. Rowling, Ventink, or Spleen, there's not a lot going on. 
That's the problem, okay? It's like 900 to 1,000 pages of random conversations about characters and, like, chat logs, and it's not even a good mystery. Like, it, it fails as a mystery novel because the mystery isn't good. There's no real mystery. It's a bunch of people, like, it's, it's, it's like the worst kind of web novel, and if I ever talk about web novels, and I probably will at some point, because they're all awful. And they fail for this reason, because it's just things happening, and, like, it's just articulating them doing things on the computer. That's all it is. It's the main characters in a game, talking to people in game, and then... It turns out that the one who did the murder in the beginning was not involved in the game at all and not a moderator and everything that they did, all of the investigations were pointless. Like, but and the thing is, though, is it's not even really a compelling, like, murder, like, murder mystery. So here's the thing, like, murder mysteries in general require a hook. And I've said this before about plots. Something acts on something else, and we as the audience want to know why. You need all these elements, okay? And so in a murder mystery, which fits this exactly, it's person A murders person B. We as the audience want to know why. Why did they kill them? Okay, think about Sherlock Holmes, okay? Sherlock Holmes is one of the most basic, simple stories. Okay, all of their, their and they're not even really well-told told mysteries, most of the time, okay? But they at least bother to establish all of the characters, okay? So what usually happens in a Sherlock Holmes mystery, which is like the bedrock of the mystery novel, is there's a there's a problem. Something's happening, okay? So, like, what, what what's a good one? What's a simple one to use? How about, like, like the Redhead Society, or whatever it's called, where, like, it's a scam, but, like, there's this society of, of people with redheads, and and they start recruiting members and, and claiming that they're a society. And, you know, it seems seems weird, and so, you know, Sherlock Holmes and, and Watson have to investigate. And then it turns out that, actually, they were scamming people because what they do is that they set up a shop next to, like, a person they want to rob or a bank, and then... They rob the bank or the the famous or the rich person, and then they blame the members of the society that they've recruited. Okay, so someone acts on something else. We want to know why. We want to know what's about it. We want to know why this is happening. What's so weird about it? Okay, this book fails that because the initial hook is successful person creates something. People are like it's transphobic, and then that person is murdered. Okay, and we're like, okay, but the problem is, is that rather than focus on why was this person murdered, because we already know, <laughs> like, we already know that they were murdered, we already know, the, like, rather than focus on, like, discovering their identity or making their identity important, the book spends all of its time chasing down red herrings, so, like, it's it's such a it's not even like a mystery. It's a clear cut situation where person A says person B is transphobic. Person A murders person B because of it, and disappears from the story, so that the author can go around and complain that everyone thinks that this thing is transphobic, and how it's awful that people say that, and then. The murderer turns out to be an unstable person who thinks that anyone who does anything or says anything transphobic online or otherwise needs to be murdered because they're a straw man for the author's bigotries, essentially. Like, this is all about, like, creating a martyr complex for the author and being like, see, authors are being murdered for for creating and everybody who is... uh you know, criticizing them is basically taking a machete to them and murdering them. Like, that's that's their whole thing. And it's it's such a self-insert situation. Like, it's a woman 
accused of transphobia who gets murdered. Oh. <laughs> and like, you know, it, everything about it is just like, there's no plot line beyond this because everything is just about them going online and having chat conversations for 900 pages. <laughs> it's such a long book. You could write this story in like, you know, you could write this story in five pages, probably. Like, if you cut out all of the random chat logs, if you cut out all of the exposition about characters who are barely in the story, like, this is a five-page story. <laughs> like, because, like, the, the entire story removed, if you removed everything, like, all of the, all of the bloat is creator creates something popular, person online takes personal offense, murders them, and then the main character spends the entire time not finding anything about them and chasing down red herrings, only to discover that the killer is a character we've not been introduced to yet, who is actually a crazy person. Uh, and then the story ends. And that's it. And I'm not really sure why this all needed to be written. I'm not sure why it's 900 pages. I'm not sure why she thought this was a good addition to the series. Again, I've not written, like, I've not read the other five books. So I don't know if the other five books are like this. I assume that they're not. Because I can't imagine that she would get a major publisher to publish six books like this. And I feel like if she had done this, people would have said something by now. Like, I have heard more about this book than any of the others. I wasn't even really aware that she was writing other books under a pseudonym before this point. Like, I had no, like, awareness. I knew that she had written other books, but I didn't know that, like, as far back as 2013, she was writing, like crime novels. I didn't know that. I didn't care. Like, so I can only assume that they're not like this. Like, I can only assume that the other ones are, are nothing like this, but if your introduction to the series, like my introduction to the series, was this book, it's not a good one. Like, I don't know. I just don't know what else to say about it. It's a train wreck. It is way too long. It's convoluted. It's boring. It's an and-then book. Like, what else can you say about it? Like, just... It's just... I don't know. I, I don't know. It, it's... It's it's amazing to me that this is the sort of thing produced by an author who has ostensibly written, like, good books before. You know, maybe, maybe it was just kind of like she struck gold when she wrote the originals. Because again, with the, with the original four books, they were written in a four-year period. So like Philosopher's Snow, Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, and Goblin of Fire were written in a year each. So 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000. And they take place at the same time as they're being written. Okay, so they take place in the 90s. So, again, she's writing about stuff she knows about. She's writing about characters, you know, in her own time period. She's adding lots of other things, but she's basically writing what she already knows. And it works. Um, what doesn't really work is that I don't think she knows anything about crime, and I don't think she knows how to pace or structure a mystery novel. And again, maybe she the other ones are great. But reading this, it doesn't feel like she actually knows the difference of how different genres are written. So, like, Harry Potter is very much an adventure story. And adventure stories are written a certain way because we, as the audience, are going on the adventure with the main character. So we're experiencing the world with the main character. We experience it through their eyes. Okay, that's why 
Like, that's why I think the early books of the Harry Potter series are the best ones, because the author, the character, and the reader are all going on the same journey, and it all works. Because we're all on the same page. Whereas this, the author is on a completely different page, in a completely different universe, than the reader. The author is basically just on an tan endless tangent, just writing whatever nonsense comes to mind, and then realize that, oh, I'm 850 pages in, I need to, like, end this somehow. And then just, like, grabs, like, whatever... Like, it, it violates the Chekhov's gun principle repeatedly and endlessly. It's like the anti-Chekhov's gun book. For those of you who don't know, Chekhov's gun is a, is a literary uh, rule. It's not really a rule, but it's a convention where if you introduce something, it needs to be important to the plot. So, like, if you if if you if you talk about a room and you mention that there's a gun on the mantle, that gun needs to be important somehow. It needs to, like, it needs to be a part of the plot. Because otherwise, why did you, like, bring attention to it? Okay? And this book is, like, the antithesis of that, where so much is brought attention... Like, there's attention drawn to like, hundreds of different things and characters, and none of it is relevant. None of it has any importance. None of it means anything. It's just there, okay? And it's... It's so tiring. Like, it's... It, it's beyond tiring. <sighs> but yeah, that's the Ink Black Heart, man. It's, uh... It's not good. It sucks. You know, it... it like, I... When I started Your Story Stinks, I didn't really want to talk about... I want it to be nice, I guess, you know? Because even when you find bad stories, you can usually find something good about them, you know? You can find something that works. And, um, you know, like when I discuss Sandman and how much I dislike Sandman, because I'm not a huge fan of Neil Gaiman and how he writes stories. You know, it's still well-written. I think it's all nonsense, for the most part, and he, he spends way too much time on esoteric bullshit, but, you know, it's well-researched, and he put a lot of effort into it, and it's coherent. I think it's dumb, but it's coherent, and I understand why people like it. I don't understand why anyone would like this. Like, I have zero idea why anyone could pick this up and go, yes, this is what I want. I want 900 pages of reading chat logs. I want 30 plus characters who are all talked about when they're not around. So every scene turns into two characters talking about char a third character who is not involved, who we don't see. <laughs> like, I want events to just happen and have no clear understanding of why or how they're happening. I want, like, the villain to be a character we've not been introduced to, <laughs> and who has nothing to do with anything that we've spent any time on in any of this. Like, I can't imagine being someone who's like, yes, all of this is good. Perfect. Print it. And I know at this point she could just print anything and put her name on it, but she's writing under a pseudonym. Okay? It's really ironic, I think, that she's railing against anonymous people yelling about how much they hate other people while writing under a pseudonym about how much she hates her critics. Like, the irony is so thick, like, you could kill somebody with it. Like, it could be a solid block, and you could, like, bludgeon someone to death with it as a concept. <laughs> it's just so bad. It's just not good. <sighs> I don't know. And, and I'll be honest with you, I already hate novels because I think they're overlong and people aspire to write novels for the wrong reason, but no, no book should be like 900 or a thousand pages long. Like no book, no one book should be that long, especially not a mystery. Okay. 
Lord of the Rings could get away with that <laughs> because it's an adventure story. You know, Harry Potter could get away with that because it's an adventure story. You know, adventure stories, you can just keep writing stuff and things can keep happening. I mean, that's usually like, when you think about like old school uh, adventure novels like Conan, you know, you can just keep writing stories. You just keep writing things happening to them. Doesn't matter when or where they take place, just keep adding stuff. You can do that, you know? You can't do that with a mystery novel, okay? You can't do that, especially not with something that's meant to be a thriller. Because you can't... Like, imagine if a roller coaster was was three hours long, <laughs> you know? Imagine if you got in a roller coaster and it was just, like, way... Like, it just kept going for three hours or something. It wouldn't be fun anymore, and it would just be, like, really annoying. You'd be like, why am I still sitting here, and why am I trapped on this ride? You know? It's just... It's just not good. It's just very not good in every way. And I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, I would love to see somebody, like, who likes this explain why they like it. Because... I just, I just can't imagine, like, I can't imagine somebody coming up with arguments for why this is good, okay? I cannot imagine somebody defending this as well-written, because it's not. I mean, I don't think it is, and that's my opinion. It's, so, but normally when I talk about my opinion, I try to think, okay, what's the contrary opinion, you know? What's the contrary opinion of somebody who likes, I don't know, Invincible, which I hate, you know? What's the contrary opinion? What do they think, and why do they think it's good? I can't imagine the arguments for somebody going, yes, having all of these, like, conversations discussed in chat log, having all these third-person conversations, having the main villain be someone you're not introduced to having like like having it be 900 to like a thousand pages long is all, all of this is good perfect it's kind of like i can't imagine somebody making that argument and so i don't know like i think maybe she's just writing now because she's got like like i think she's just writing now because she's bitter and angry and she's just venting her spleen, like I said at the beginning. And that's her only motivation. This is a book written, like... I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but whenever you discuss a work, you should always think about why is the author writing? Who is this for? Who is this, who is this book for? Who is this being written for? Like, even if it's being written for the author, even if the writer is writing for themselves, even if that's their audience, like, normally you should be, like, you can gleam something from that, okay? I, went, I talked about Lovecraft earlier. Lovecraft was writing for himself, mostly. He was writing about his fears and insecurities and bigotries, and he was talking mostly to himself about himself and putting them into, into words. J.K. Rowling is writing entirely for herself, in the sense that she's writing so she can hear her own opinion spoken back to her. That's it. Again, as I said in the beginning, it's like being trapped in an elevator with someone who feels the need to keep you hostage as they rant about their own insecurities and bigotries and their need to be a victim. And it's just not very interesting. <sighs> I don't know. I don't have anything else more to say. I can't, I, I can't think of anything else to describe this book. I think I've gone over literally everything. And it's just bad. Don't read it. Okay? I mean, even if you're, like, curious about it, I wouldn't read it. Just don't. Like, find a Cliff Notes or something. Don't read the book yourself. It's just not good. <laughs> it's just not worth it. No book is worth... Like, no bad book is worth reading for 950 pages or whatever. It just isn't. But... Anyway, that's your story sucks. So, see y'all later.